For those who were here last week, uh, you remember that we reenacted 1960. And uh, the choir graciously went up into the choir loft, where it hasn't been for a number of years, and I went out and got a morning coat and an ascot. And I dare say, I, we all look pretty good. And I said, what can I do after that? Surely there has to be something else I can do. And then it occurred to me, you know, I'm not the only Fred who's ever preached. hear that the National Guard is giving a bigger bonus now if you sign up. I wonder why. It says in this same article that uh, recruits of African, origin, African descent, you know, they've been a very strong part of the armed forces. Uh, they're way down now. Standing outside Creston High School in Grand Rapids is 18-year-old senior Dexter Ward who was unimpressed. $20,000, I still wouldn't join. Ward is skeptical about the need for U.S. troops in Iraq. I don't want to die for nobody. What am I going to die for? Oil? I don't think blacks should be there. It's Bush's problem. Well, gee whiz. I think there's a problem. It's dropped down a lot. I don't think I can add anything to that except that you should read that. It seems that the Democrats are a little annoyed that Ann Coulter is coming to Michigan. I figure... Uh, you come, girl. This will be interesting. Uh, I knew that when I, worked in, uh, when I worked in Texas, every time an evangelist came to town and stirred up a lot of dust, he, he or she always shook out at least 20 or 30 new liberals. So as far as I'm concerned, she can come here as often as, I, as, as she wants, you know. She could do better work for me than I possibly could. Did you see that, the, that uh, Robert E. Rich died this week, he was 92. He invented whipped non-dairy topping. You never know what you're gonna take to your grave, right? Uh, unfortunately, not everything is quite so amusing. We have new photos for, out of Abu Ghraib. What are they thinking? And I'm sorry, maybe they're just not. This is really bothering me, and it bothers other people so much so that a member of this congregation who served in the armed forces has started an Amnesty International chapter because that fact so offended his military sensibility. And, of course, uh, we have other fine things going on. I'm trying to remember why I picked this one up. Was it down here? Oh. Cheney needs to break his silence about the shooting. This is from Linda Chavez, so I guess he'd listen to her. Uh, anyone here besides me occasionally listen to uh, uh, What Do You Know? Anybody hear it on Saturday morning? Okay, if you didn't hear it, they started with a tape of Elmer Fudd singing, A Hunting I Will Go. <laughs> I can't go that far, honestly, but I'm sure you could dig it up online in streaming video. Uh, there's always too much that I could talk about, but I want to finish off a series I started uh, three weeks ago on uh, the why and how and what of worship at Fountain Street Church. And with all this stuff going on, you might say, why are we even bothering to get together? There's so much out there that needs to be done. Why even spend the time, much less the money? But we do. All churches do. That's why they call it a, quote, house of worship. Uh, 
Some people do it because God told them to or because the Bible says you have to or because it's what is done. Uh, but I had to ask, our, ask myself and ask you, why do we do it? We don't owe allegiance to a theology or to a book, so why do we do this? And my answer two weeks ago was that we come here to practice being spiritually alive. This is the place where we rehearse thinking and feeling and noticing the world so that we can be more present out there. And then I asked the next week, how should we do this? Do we need this building, the choir, the pulpit, the organ, the preacher? And I said, strictly speaking, we don't need any of it. What matters is that we find a way to wake up a little more to our reality, to our personal reality and our worldly reality. And if it takes music to do that, or preaching, or organs, or sanctuaries, or robes, or cutaways, it makes no difference as long as you leave this room a little bit more alert to who you are than when you walked in. That's just good pedagogy, don't you think? As a teacher, as a spiritual teacher, and that's one of my roles here, is to somehow bring you a little bit more awake than you were when you came in the room. But now I'm going to go back and suggest that while we don't actually worship in the formal sense, in a certain sense we actually do, because all three sermons have been about our, yes, our capacity to be idolaters. In this case, the, the idol worship of place, of habit, and today the idol worship of self, that I am the most fine creature there is. Now, most of us don't actually think that, but we come here hoping to be consoled and comforted and lifted up. And the dangerous edge there attaches to being confirmed as much as affirmed, being told you're fine the way you are, which is not entirely true. Emerson said, a person will worship something. Of that, there is no doubt. And he points out that what we worship is what we are becoming. So I'm asking in this last sermon, what is it that we worship because what is it that we wish to become? And to choose the thing that is worthy of our becoming. I stepped down to uh, Spring Lake yesterday, which was hardly spring-like, and uh, overheard uh, John Shelby Spong, the uh, renegade Episcopal bishop. Uh, it was a lot of fun to listen to, and his books are certainly worth a look at. One of the things he pointed out something that anyone who goes to seminary gets taught, whether they tell you or not, is that what you are told about the nature of reality is pretty much a lie, especially in the Bible, and that recovering the, the message that's inside of it, not the message on the front of it, takes a lot of effort. What John Shelby Spong wants you, me, and everyone else to do, what I want you to do, what you want to do, is to get to that thing that's really worth your worship, that thing that's worth becoming. And I'm going to put a phrase from the 13th century theologian Meister Eckhart in you right now. If God were to backslide from the truth, I would cling to the truth and let God go. I'll say that again. If God were to backslide from the truth, I would cling to the truth and let God go. That's a full five centuries before Thoreau was saying essentially the same thing, to drive life into a corner, to reduce it to lowest terms, and to find out if it be mean to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish it to the world, or if it be sublime to know it by experience and to give a true account. What it is that we want to worship in the best sense of the term the reason why you are here and not there, the reason why you are here and not at home, the reason why you have any hope at all is because you want the truth. That's the only thing worthy of your worship. And unlike a few good men, you can handle the truth. You just can't handle all of it every day. Because what we worship 
is the thing to which we are ultimately accountable, the thing by which you are measured, the thing you say, if I am distant from it, I will make an effort to go more like that. And what do you want to be more like than that which is true as opposed to that which is false? Ah, but here we have a problem. So Pilate stands there in the temple one fateful Thursday evening and says, but what is truth? And Jesus says, I am the truth. How do we know the truth? Boy, that's tough. We are always asking, what is truth? Says Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk. And then crucifying the truth that stands before our eyes. That's a really good observation. Learning the truth that's out there wherever there is, first requires acknowledging a truth that's in here. The truth inside yourself, the internal truth of who you are, an honesty with yourself that you would like to be able to do with some degree of safety. Who of us wants to disrobe in front of everyone? But that's what it comes down to the word that I use uh, in a different location, is esodesious, molting and shedding, and I'll get back to that. But when you take something off, you have less on, you are less protected. So learning the truth about yourself, confessing it even to yourself, requires a certain degree of safety or you'll never do it. If you do not tell the truth about yourself, though, says Virginia Woolf, you cannot tell it to other people. And so the first task about worshiping the truth is to start with the truth about who you are and only you know that truth and only you can really admit it. And I really don't want to hear it, but I want you to be able to listen to it. And so the truth that we have to start with is not the big T truth that's out there, but the small T truth that is in here. And this truly is what I hear when I go to the Gospel of John and Jesus says supposedly, the truth will set you free. Until you acknowledge the truth of your own self, you're miserable, happy, broken, strong, weak, uncertain, certain, loved, unloved, likable, unlikable, every bit of it. You are a prisoner to who you do not know, the self that you are that you have not acknowledged. Following the other parable uh, that I read, not today, but another place, that we cannot remove the speck from your eye up there, sir, if I have a, a fleck in my own. My capacity to see another is marred by my inability to see out of my own eye if I haven't done the inward assay to acknowledge the truth of who I am to myself so I can say, well, I need a pair of glasses now before I can make a, a judgment about anything. 